Now, if I might have your attention, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll start the uh, breakout session, which is uh, focused on uh, innovation uh, in, and um, technology. And uh, first speaker is Martin Meehan. Uh, Martin is principal of Meehan Associates and chairman of Meehan Green. Uh, he's a registered architect, chartered architectural technologist, chartered arbitrator, environmentalist, and lean accredited professional. Uh, Martin's uh, Meehan Associates was formed in 1993 and has delivered best in class facilities for major clients in Ireland, throughout Europe, and the rest of the world. Uh, Meehan Green was formed in 2016 from Meehan Associates to concentrate on uh, lead accreditation, education, and advice. Is also involved in uh, other forms of acc accreditation, such as WELL. Uh, me and Green discharges projects worldwide. Uh, the furthest project to date uh, from Ireland is, has been in Japan. Uh, Martin's presentation, which is kind of dear to my heart, the work I started on, off with uh, in my early career is, is um, uh, sympathetic conservation and conversion of old buildings. So his presentation is called uh, From Sales Lug to Silk Purse. The story of the renovation of Block B, East Point Business Park in Dublin to Leed Platinum to provide a leading edge uh, uh, office environment. The building is the first of a sequence of renovations which are ongoing at present. A best in class environment was delivered in seven months and exceptionally fast delivery. It involved a complete strip out of 5,700 square metre building major structural alteration, uh, reglazing, atrium construction, and a full fit-out. Martin will present the project, explain some of the special features incorporated in the design, and explain the journey which will develop the design approach to the next five buildings in the sequence. The Block B project uh, has won a number of awards, being uh, Best Irish Commercial Fit-out Project in the Build Architectural Awards 2016. Uh, Green Project of the Year Award in the Irish Construction Industry Awards 2016 and Meehan Associates won Best Sustainable Design Company in Ireland in the Build Architectural Awards 2016. So I'll ask Martin to come forward and present the project. Thank you. Morning everyone. Um, thanks Martin for the invite, GMIT for the invite. We're delighted to come along and speak to you all today. Um, thank you for outlining what we've done to date, which is great. And I've got to try and work this one out now. Yeah, there we go. Great. Um, following on what Tom Parlin was saying earlier, just to give you a little bit of an idea about Meehan Associates, 50% uh, of our staff are female not 10% or 20%, 50%. In fact, probably 53%. Women in construction is a big feature in our office and a major contributor to our success. Um, some of the projects that were mentioned by John of ACOM there, we're involved as lead AP for the Hanging Gardens project in Limerick and for the Opera project. And Tom mentioned about deep retrofit. Now you're gonna get involved in deep retrofit. This is this is great stuff. I put this up so that you'd know where Dublin is. So as we focus in on Dublin, we're looking at East Point. East Point is a business park which was built on a dump, a reclaimed site. It's just on the outside of the city. And you can see there, park. Underneath that park is rubbish. Underneath all of this is rubbish, and this is East Point Business Park. Built, commenced about 20 odd years ago, and the park is a very substantial business park. Beautiful park, designed by Scott Tom Walker. Absolutely excellent. The building we're going to be talking about is actually this building here. And it's funny that when you go back to Google Maps and you see that the building is showing up as it is today, you realize that Google are traversing the earth on an ongoing basis, updating all of these maps. Block B has two atria. You can see the little glazed features there. This is block A. The atria in block A are open weld, and that was the way block B was before we started. It was an old enough building. So effectively, we had holes down to the ground here. It was a naturally ventilated building. So we started to move on it. November 2014, we were asked to 
commence design work. We had to get all the design work put together, planning put together, fire, disability access, and turn to the project. And in such a short period, we were on site in May. We located the client in 2015, November, a very short period. So here you've got an old building. Here it is, 18 years old. Look at it. A jaded building with radiator heating, very little air handling. The central atria that I spoke about, the fact that the natural ventilation extended into the heart and core of the space. A bit overgrown when we took it over because it hadn't been looked after and it had a few other occupants in the building as well. So we started to take it apart. These buildings were built on a six meter grid, cast in situ slabs. So what you've got is you've got solid concrete structures. We took out the central cores, took out all the toilets, <coughs> took out everything, and then started to look at putting the lid on the roof. So we were building these two atria, stripping the whole roof, putting a green roof onto the roof, creating an atrium structure, steel on top of concrete. Fairly large. These atria are 12 meters by 12 meters. Internally, as we took out the internal, got it the whole out, uh, the central core, took it all out, took all the glazing around the area. We then started to put in staircases. Staircases were clipped on. Special high performance lifting gear to pop it into place because they're quite heavy. Started to build internally, put in the mechanical and the electrical. The building is fully air conditioned with a four pipe system. Started to create partitions. Partitions are finished with armor coat, highly polished plaster, very nicely finished, nice rib, beautiful colors. We use the neutral and colors. You'll see colors later. The atrium itself started to take shape. You can see it there now. And the uh, glazing around the, the, the atrium, the, the, the support glazing, the barrier glazing starting to appear. As the building started to take form, I'm going to explain parts of it to you and also some of the things that we had to incorporate in the design from day one in order to facilitate the operation of the building. This is called a spider. This passes through 860 millimeters of width. It's necessary in order to get up 15 meters in height in order to sort out the stuff that you might have at the higher levels of the atrium space. And the reason why I bring it here is to tell you and reinforce with you as you're designing, as you're looking at things as we're going forward, remember that you could be starting with a, a thing as simple as this, which affects so much in the, the actual operation of the building. This can come in, it travels over the raised access floor, but the raised access floor is a high performance raised access floor in the areas that it travels. And when it gets into the central area, it can go right up that full height. It's fascinating to see it operate. We put a new green roof on the building, we put a totally new roof on the building, but this green roof operates on the sustainability side to stop the massive runoff of water off the roof. I'm sure you're familiar with green roofs. We put solar water heaters on the roof as well. They work to serve the showers. Funny enough, even though it's a big building, it doesn't need an awful lot of hot water. We used photovoltaic. Photovoltaic again gained us a certain amount of green accreditation and the photovoltaic array, we were only able to put up this array on this part of the building. It powers the lighting in 50% of the second floor on a constant basis. The partitions we used were a bit posh, to be very honest with you. The glazed partitions give a 50 dB sound rating. The average partition has a 28 dB sound rating and the distance between 28 and 50 is huge as you're probably aware. As we were creating out the floors, remember I showed you the floor plan. You had the atrium space in the center and you had the floors around like two donuts. In the donuts, we have all of these collaboration spaces, open spaces with loose seating and screens, digital screens. We created an auditorium. 
The auditorium is retractable, it moves back in and can be tidied away. Since they moved in 15 months ago, that has never been put away. That is a very valuable part of what they do in getting together, talking about what they're doing, and educating. This atrium space is fantastic because this, the sound system and the AV system we have there, it's like being at an IMAX studio. Fantastic. This gives you a view of the, of the height within the atrium. <coughs> within the atrium. And this, the speaking position is normally from here. But people often speak from down below as well. Pretty cool. They created a social media hub. Interesting. Social media hub. When they release some piece of information into the market, they want to know what's happening out there. Just like there's a, as far as I know, there's a blog or a feed going out from here today to get people interested in what's happening here. This happens in the digital world as well. And then they map by taking feed in from the internet into this room, which looks down over the, one of the main atria and reception areas onto the screens behind. And it gives a digital dispersal around the world of all the interactive conversations that are taking place <coughs> at that time. So they watch and control and see what's happening around the world when they're feeding the information out there. That picture shows you in the background, not a very good one because we weren't able to take a, a really front up one. But as you can see, the screen is blue on the back and there's little white dots, lots of little white dots. And they're sort of happening and they're clustering and you get somewhere to a big cluster. That's the image of the digital conversation happening in the world when something is released. And they're monitoring and having a look at it and seeing what's happening. The meeting rooms were set up very specially to be collaboration, uh, AV, and discussion rooms. Very nicely set up with some acoustic attenuation as well. Breakout areas are popped around the building so that people can have coffee. The cafeteria for this building is in another building because they have a number of buildings in the campus and there's a much bigger cafeteria in an adjacent building. But breakout areas are important to get people to talk, relax, and discuss. We mentioned water earlier. There was a chat about water. And Tom Parlin was saying that it wasn't a political thing. It is a political thing, and it's very important. It's one of our biggest commodities going forward in the world, let's, let's be very honest. So low flow delivery, managing water within a building is critical to the building. And it's part of the lead accreditation process. It's part of the sustainability achievement that you will gain within the lead process. So what we have here is we have sensor taps and low flow. So you get enough water to do what you need, but it disappears very quickly. The system that's used here, this support system behind, is access paneled, very handy, it's very good, very easy to design and, and operate. And matches in very nicely with the cubicleized system for the loos. The loos themselves are all low flow as well. So they're censored, low flow. That means that the water used for many, many people is a lot less than it could be. We put in low flow showers as well. Sometimes people get worried about low flow showers. Is there going to be enough water? Absolutely. No problem. No negative responses whatsoever. Solar control is very important in a building because a building can heat up and cool down. The reaction to that is an energy reaction which demands either heating or cooling, cooling or heating. But this building is concerned because we have an awful lot of glazing in the building. We, we, we took out solid panels and we changed those panels into clear panels. There's a potential for higher solar gain. The new panels that were put in are solar controlled, but we put on blinds. The problem with blinds in buildings, if you look at a building, you'll see that some blinds are down, some blinds are up, and the building looks absolutely terrible. So in order to manage that process, and the fact that people would leave a blind down, we have a whole system around the building that people can drop a blind down and leave it, and after two hours it will slowly start to come back up again. Big benefit here that it, it's letting light into the building, and we need light because it affects how much energy we're using in our actual internal lighting system. 
The atrial space, because of the glazing to the roof, can take an awful lot of light in. It's amazing how when the sun is on full tilt, no clouds in the sky, and we do get those days, there's a lot of light comes in here. And if it's causing a problem, these solar control blinds can be taken across and they help to reduce that impact. But at night, this building puts duvet on. Seven o'clock at night, the blinds all work. The duvet comes on, the material in the blinds is both insulative as well as reflective. And it contains the heat or the cool in the building. Really great, really great. I mentioned lighting. We have a lighted system in the building which is lighting control. Each light, every light, has an individual control. That sensor has an occupancy sensor, it has a thermal sensor, and it has a light sensor. It knows what the light is in the area, and it knows what light it has to deliver. Fully controlled. So it delivers the right amount of light in the area if the area is occupied. So in the evening time, there's a more penal regime because the lights will close down very quickly, whereas during the day it depends on, it, it, it sort of thinks that there's going to be people there for longer really and, and it will stay on slightly longer, but at night time the lights will cut off very, very quickly. The lighting is a mixture of both LED and T5. T5 because these panels here that we were very interested in weren't available in LED while we were doing project. But all of these lights here and all of the general lighting throughout all the rest of the building is LED. These are white LED. We have RGB LED which allows us to change color and give a mood atmosphere. So on St. Patrick's Day I hope they turn it green. As the building was created we have open plan office spaces and we have collaboration spaces. And then we have rooms of different types. Rooms where people can go to work on a project for an hour or have a phone call because in the outside, in the outer, outer areas, noise can be a factor. So we created these single person workspaces, phone booths. You can go in, you can work away. They're not terrifically comfortable because they're small, but you're not going to be there for a terribly long time. But they're panelled beside four person, six person and larger meeting rooms. Outside, I mentioned about the furniture. We have some differing types of furniture around the building. You've seen some of it already. And then set in the center of the collaboration spaces, we have what are called V-pods. V-pods, again, are single person spaces that you can go into, like a TARDIS, lock the door, and there you go, work away. The V-pod is a definite single person space. Color was used to give ourselves the floors, orange on the ground, yellow, and green, as you can see, that colored polished plaster works very, very well. And we matched it in with the furniture as it went to give a relationship on the floors. Naturally, a modern day company is involved in recycling. And recycling stations are around the building alongside the copying or printer stations and they work extremely well. Part of the lead accreditation process can be that you're going to make people aware of what their building does. It's all very well you come in here and you see that we've you know, fluorescence and that and they're good and you, you know a little bit about it but nobody else does and if you're putting in a sustainable endeavor it's nice to be able to tell people about it. So around the building in lots of places there are all these little plaques that have a certain amount of information telling people that this is how your loos work, this is how your lighting works, this is the way this works, that works because everything we've used carpeting, the wall material, all the kit is designed and created from a sustainable base. It's always great fun when a client changes their mind midstream. Sometimes it puts a little pressure on and sometimes it puts a lot of pressure on. In the lead process, it takes 60 points to gain gold, it takes 80 points minimum to gain platinum. And it's a, a real hard graft when you're asked halfway through the project, can you up your game? Luckily enough, the team in the office were able to do that. We achieved platinum and I'll show you now. 
telling you a little bit about LEAD. You might know a lot about LEAD. I got involved in LEAD. Go back to that graph that was on the, on the, the, the screen earlier where that big dip started to happen. Well, we had done a lot of work over the years with IDA, and IDA asked me to, they knew of my interest in sustainability more so than uh, they were doing anything in sustainability, so they asked me to have a look at a report that they'd got from the States and give a view on it. And what transpired from that is that IDA made a decision uh, to ensure that anything they would build following that would be LEED accredited. Now, they haven't built an awful lot. They're starting to build now. and We're involved with some of those projects on the LEED side. But LEED was emerging at that stage, and I decided that we'd, we'd target the practice to, to really become more focused on sustainability and give that as a particular offering. It's like all these things when you're, a, when you're a prophet and you're going out there and you're talking to people. I spent years going around different people telling them that they should really be embracing this. And you know when you're going out the door, there'd be a smile and they'd say, oh, yeah, right, okay, that's fine. Now, lead is huge now. We now have divided the practice so that we have Meehan Associates and Meehan Green. And Meehan Green is the default sustainability lead practice in the country. And in fact, we're stretching out throughout the world. It's a super success, and it's not due to me, let me tell you, it's due to the people involved. Nothing in all of this is really only due to me in any way, because we have a superb team. And the lead team are carving their own furrow out. So we have the architecture team flying off in one direction with superb stuff, and we have the lead team going the other way. As you can see, in 1993, the US Green Building Council was formed now, I don't know what Donald Trump's going to do about that as we go forward, but as you can see, there's been a progress right through. There's been a lot of, lot of movement, and we have, in Ireland, we have the Irish Green Building Council who are operating, and we have had it recently a change of the LEED accreditation process from version 3 to version 4. LEED is active in over 161 countries in the world, so it's very, very relevant. And if you take last year, this is the only data I have now just at the moment, but there's nearly 2 million square feet, they use the square feet, certifying every day. It's phenomenal. It's absolutely phenomenal. To introduce you to it as a sustainability program, you can see there that there are seven and two categories. Seven categories in lead version four. Lead version three is disappearing into the background. You can see there are sustainable sites. That means we want to build in cities or in towns. We don't want to build necessarily on green property. We want to ensure that water efficiency is best in class, down to even 20% of what people would normally categorize as normal use. There's no need for an awful lot of water use. In the energy and the atmosphere, we don't want to have products that are going to cause us problems. We're cutting down on particular types of gases. We're using higher efficient and better operating machinery to produce our heat. On the materials and the resources, it stands to itself. We want to have sustainable products coming through. We want to produce very good indoor air quality for people because that's important. That's the balance, that's the balance between kit that's spec'd a particular way and has to perform a particular way. And the innovation and the regional priority. Regional priority is in a country that has a particular category that is more important to them than in others. So Ireland has one, England has one, Germany has one. And innovation then, it allows us four, there's four options within a lead process to prove that you're being innovative. So all of that produces the certification levels and you can start at the base level up to platinum. And the buildings now being built, the office buildings being built in Dublin now are targeting gold at a minimum and platinum as a target. And we would be involved as lead APs on many of those. So we go back to our project timeline that we spoke about for block B. And you can see there that the, the amount of work that was done was highly aggressive. A few facts, cables, panels, PV, water reduction. In that building, 40% in use. Energy, 43%. Building size, there's the occupancy, 460. In the first six months of operation, this was calculated as the net saving on the lighting alone in the building, <coughs> which is 37 grand. Just, just great. So the client can see a tangible return. Luckily for us, 
we were good to win the Irish Construction Industry Awards, Green Project of the Year, and then Green Practice of the Year. And then in the UK, on the Architecture Awards, the Build Architecture Awards, we won both of those two categories as well. So I want you to sit back and enjoy now. Let's put together some music. Thank you. That's some very interesting work there, Martin. We, we wish you best luck with the, the rest of the project. And uh, we might uh, uh, twist your arm for a, a student visit or two uh, in due course. Yeah, will be good. Thank you. Now the second speaker in the set is Pat McGrath uh, from Construction Information Services. Uh, Pat is Head of Research and Product Development at CIS uh, and um, CIS are Ireland's leading provider of marketing intelligence for the construction industry. 
Prior to his association with CIS, Pat ran a construction market intelligence company in Northern Ireland, which was bought out by CIS in 2012. Uh, Pat has worked in this sector for over 20 years. He has a strong IT background, and earlier in his career, he was director of computer services at a university in Massachusetts. He was the lead designer also in the original Irish government procurement portal, uh, which many of us would be familiar with, uh, www.etenders.gov.ie. Uh, uh, and Pat's company then uh, run that tender portal then for about five years uh, after it was introduced. CIS uh, Online is Ireland's leading construction intelligence database and provides comprehensive real-time information on all key construction projects across the 32 counties of Ireland. I'll ask Pat to present to you now on what services CIS provide and also to look at the wider possibilities for using data mining to help and inform us in making efficient construction development decisions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Martin, and, and thank you for the invitation today, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, I want to talk about CIS in an illustrative way to illustrate the, the, the potential for uh, digital information and digital technologies in our industry today. Uh, we have come a long journey. We've been in business for over 40 years. Uh, we've been through two recessions. and. Uh, as our name suggests, our, our business is all about information and construction information. We're concerned with activity on the ground, what's happening uh, with different projects, and also what's in the pipeline, what's planned, and what's in progress in that. Our information is used by uh, many throughout the industry and provides a basis uh, you know, for, for decision making, and that's, that's the way we look at our information. What information can we provide to people? to provide them uh, with a basis for good decision making about the projects they'll get involved in uh, and the people they'll contact in that. Uh, as Martin's illustration there, um, uh, uh, our presentation illustrated there, uh, the use of information technology is phenomenal and the data behind it. I mean, the smart buildings and what they can deliver, uh, not just for our people, but also for the conservation of waste and for efficiencies uh, uh, and design and that is phenomenal and I want to look at that a little bit more and try and take you especially the students on a journey to maybe look at where your the industry may be for you and where you'll be basing your decisions on uh, more so uh, uh, on uh, the technologies and the digital information that's available and, and continues to become available uh, over time. Uh, if anyone's ever bought a new car or looked to buy a new car, you probably know that all the information, all the information gathering on all of that is usually done online in advance. Uh, in fact, by 2020, they say that 90% of uh, uh, buying decisions will be done before you contact a person. So it'll be through whatever information you get through your phone, your website, and whatever. Uh, at this stage, I want to look at the macro level of what we do, what, what information can tell us about, you know, uh, Ireland as a space and how we plan for it in the future and that. So w whereas m many of the topics today uh, are concerned with BIM and Lean at the micro level, at the project level, uh, and the huge efficiencies uh, that have been gained through that, the sustainable buildings, the, the real value that's being delivered by BIM and Lean in these projects and uh, on the environmental impacts through uh, great reduction in waste. But at the macro level, uh, I want to look at the information that will help us plan our future here. And I think it's an appropriate time to look at this because we're coming out of a, a, a very deep recession. And it's a time of renewal for a lot of people, not just for our economy, but for companies uh, like ourselves that have been in that space. And it's a time you know, when we rethink about how we do things and how we look at things. Uh, uh, and I would say for a lot of companies in our industry, uh, if there's any silver lining to a recession, it's that I think you become more efficient uh, uh, and more practical in your approach. Um, got the right button here. Yeah. So uh, CIS, just to give you a bit of background, and what, I, what I'm gonna try and do is, is illustrate our journey uh, through information, through digital information, and I think that's gonna be illustrative for the industry and the country as a whole and the, and the journey we might take. 
As I say, we've been in business uh, for 40 years. We track construction activity from, from design and early planning all the way through until a project goes on site and, and, and further down the, uh, the line until its uh, completion. We have a team of uh, 10 researchers based in uh, uh, Dublin and Banbridge in Northern Ireland, uh, and they research in various means, it can be on the phone call to architects and contractors, to ascertain what's happening on the ground with projects, where they are, what time scales, who's involved, uh, and the people that are involved in and all that. Our journey has taken us, as you can imagine, being in business over 40 years from typewriters and rebographic machines uh, and putting information out there. And I suppose the first big revolution was databases and relational databases that allowed us to turn that information around from the static uh, uh, published page uh, and to interrogate it in different ways. So, you know, simple things like looking uh, perhaps at all the projects a company can be involved in uh, and, and other aggregated uh, data we can take from databases. I suppose the next change then was the onset of the internet and putting our information online and giving people location independence from their machines and, and all of that. And the next uh, revolution as it's happening now is really uh, the use of digital technology. And this uh, can really be transformative for our industry and, and what it does. And we do need to embrace uh, this technology and look at it uh, in ways uh, that it can allow us to plan better for the future uh, and allow us to uh, plan in, in real time or as close to real time as possible. So uh, just looking at it now, so this is you know standard information that we provide to contractors, suppliers, professionals in the industry, information about a project, some metrics on the side, but you can see it's still heavily publication based or in that in that area and the companies involved uh, in those sorts of projects. We can uh, draw down some market analysis, and we do, uh, and this is information that, uh, that we did at the end of last year, and it really, uh, from our point of view, it's not uh, as we would like it to be drawn at the touch of a button and, and giving us uh, real-time information on the state of the industry. It's done from a team of uh, our researchers who have uh, specialties in, in certain areas, be it education, medical, commercial, or, or that, and we ask them to say, look, what do you think is going to be happening next year in, in 2017? And, you know, they, they pull out the projects, they look what's going to happen, and, and uh, this excludes the self-build market, by the way. So it's illustrative of that, but it, it, it illustrates again that the, the quality of nature of the information we're looking on, we're relying on our, uh, on our research staff, on, on their experience and their knowledge of the industry to draw this information out and identify uh, the projects with real potential. Similarly, with, uh, with other data we collect uh, uh, on self-build and commencements and things like that. The one big difference, uh, I suppose we would say about CIS, is that we, we verify the information. So even on commencement data, I think the last time we looked at it, I think we were, uh, I'm not calling my colleague here, but maybe 60% or so uh, of commencement data. It, and commencement data tells us when a, a, a building is about to start construction. Uh, and official figures uh, uh, would indicate when it's going to start and who the contractor is, etc. So uh, having looked at that data, we found that about 60% of it is not correct, or that buildings don't start on time. There may be a few blocks laid in the ground and, and various reasons. So the information is not, is not accurate. And again, uh, and I'll, I'll uh, illustrate this point more uh, in future slides then, that has the potential to skew our decision making a little bit because if we base our decisions on that information, then it may not be correct on that. Okay, so, um, uh, so we've decided, as I said, it was a time coming out of the recession and we renewed, and I suppose we had a root and branch review of what we do and how we do things. And one of the things we decided to do was, was look at information in a different way, look at the structures and the buildings that we're reporting on and uh, uh, researching in a different way. And we started looking at it, as, if any of you are involved in the technology space or programming space, we started looking at objects and the attributes associated with objects. And, uh, and this is something that Ordnance Survey Ireland do very well. They tell us form and function, what's a building used for uh, and what attributes are associated with it. And that. And, uh, and there are many things. So the sort of things, just to give you some of the example and, and where our research is going these days, we're starting to look at, at structures and then we're looking at all uh, the data associated with it. The key and the common denominator uh, and a lot of, the, of this is the geolocation, which is absolutely essential. 
And then we look at you know, many other things, value square footage and housing units, so not just the number of units, the type of housing, whether these are phased and all of these sorts of things in the schedules behind them. And this again allows us to give more accurate pictures of what's going on, whether it's beds for nursing homes and hotels, classrooms, pupil numbers, hospital beds, car parking spaces, washing covers, etc., number of wind farms and all of that. And that in itself is good data for us and good data for our customers. It tells them what's happening, you know, hotel spaces in a particular development and all of that. But the real benefit of this information is when we combine it with other data sets, when we look at it in conjunction with what else is happening out there in the industry. So it could be census data, population demographics, housing, education, you know, where schools are, working jobs, social class, migration, uh, uh, and all of those sorts of things. So when we start to combine our data with these data sets, then we start to reveal pictures and gain insight into our industry and, and get more meaningful information from what we do by sharing all of this. So and this can be very simple things, you know, like looking at census data, uh, uh, looking at the age of uh, uh, the population and deciding where the demand is going to be for schools in the future, primary and secondary. And, you know, uh, uh, and as I say, that's at a very simple level. Fantastic data sets and fantastic work being done in Ireland uh, by many diverse bodies um, and universities and all of that, but all of this data can be used in conjunction uh, with other data sets to reveal information, so whether it's flood data, unfinished housing and all of that, you just have to look at the data to, to realise the potential of it and all of uh, that it offers. So, for example, as I said, geolocation is really the common denominator of this, where something is in its place, in its space uh, uh, within Ireland. Uh, and its sim a simplest form, this is really just placing points on a, on a map. Um, and that's a very simple mapping project. Commercial activity in Dublin. And, and we've just sort of put some metrics in there, what's happening, square footage, all of that sort of thing. And that's really at its simplest form uh, of information that we can illustrate our information. But once we start to add the metrics we're starting to gather, um, then we start to get a little bit of insight, even from our own data, before we even merge it with other data. Now, I should say that it's not very anybody that's involved in adding information to databases and all that will realize that you face significant legacy issues if you want to go back and analyze trends and stuff like that. And that's a project we're involved in at the moment is you know, taking our data back to 2014 and backfilling all of these information and all of these metrics. It's a huge exercise, but it's already proving a very worthwhile exercise. So, for example, if we look at this, this is a small project one of my colleagues uh, did in the office, and they looked at student accommodation, backfilled the data. Uh, so one of the things you can see straight away that was, was quite revealing to us that already in 2017, we have more student accommodation on site than we did in the whole of 2016. Now, how does, that how does that feed back to good decision making and strategy and, uh, and whatever? Well, if you can imagine, uh, and hopefully not sometime not in the far too distant future, that that information is fed somewhat real time or as close to real time and it feeds back into a strategy. Uh, for example, the Rebuilding Ireland strategy is going on in the moment. Student housing uh, obviously has an impact there, even the rental accommodation, so if they're separate, uh, student accommodation being built to accommodate that, accommodate that, then it's going to relieve some of the pressures on, on the housing market and on, on, on uh, social housing in particular uh, around the Dublin area. So again, we're just looking at this uh, in illustrative ways, but uh, the, the impact that this can have on strategy if we're able to bring all this data together uh, and look at it in the real way and look at plans and strategies that are really live in nature. They're not ad hoc and looking back uh, based on past data uh, and that. And, and Rebuilding Ireland, I think, is a good illustration of, of attempts uh, by the government to embrace this. Uh, it's a very good strategy. Um, they put out reviews, quarterly reviews on it, which is excellent because you can see the action points. It leads to transparency, which is very much needed in government. So we can all see, we can all monitor and see what's happening on. There are some... Uh, uh, contention, contention uh, about the data behind the housing strategy because it in itself tends to be 
a bit ad hoc based on commencements or ESB connection data. And many commentators have pointed out perhaps uh, the downside of using such data. But you can see that if we if were able to bring real-time data uh, on stream, then that would very much affect how we, uh, how we adjust strategies and how our strategies can be changed uh, in the very short term or adjusted. And, and really, that's the, a good strategy these days is not something that sits on a shelf. It's an active policy document that's ongoing and changing all the time. The ability to drill into data, um, again, uh, and again, and this, this just a, a very important part of putting this information and, uh, and aggregating this information is feeding it back to the citizens. And anybody that's seen the, the plans for the Dublin Docklands and things like that, I mean, it's fantastic information, fantastic feedback to the citizens and, and what's going on. And this, you know, allows us just to see and to feed back to people interested in the space what's going on. And uh, it's more visually appealing than perhaps an Excel table or a, a, a chunk of text. Okay, so um, digital technologies uh, uh, are embedded in all the devices we use. Everybody, has, you know, practically everybody has a phone now, and there's devices even uh, through Martin's presentation. I mean, the, uh, the smarts behind those buildings is really from the sensors and the information that's provided to those from sensors and uh, allow the building to be very efficient in, in all the ways that, that, that were illustrated. But the real beauty of this data, as I said, is harnessing it and combining it with other data sets. So, uh, for example, now, if you looked at a, a business, traditionally businesses in the past have planned based on financial information, which by its very nature is ad hoc. What happened last year? What happened in the last quarter? All those sorts of things, and then you make your plans. But things move very fast today, and that's really not good enough for most modern businesses and what they end up, what, what, what good businesses now do is that they're tuned into their customers, they, they know what's happening, they see the trends or they see where the future is going and they adjust their processes and their systems and they upskill their people and uh, we become very much proactive in what we do in business if it's done right that way. And I would argue the very same thing is the case now for, for our information. We, we cannot. Uh, rely going into the future on ad hoc data to make our, our decisions on planning and space and, and how we build our cities and how we construct our cities. Uh, we must start getting good, uh, uh, good uh, real-time or as close to real-time information to feed into the strategies that we're going to make uh, for the future. The ability to plan in, the, in these short time frames allows for, for very quick adjustments uh, in strategy. So getting information back we should have active plans that allow us to adjust and, uh, and adapt and change uh, as good strategies should. It doesn't mean that we don't have long-term plannings and long-term strategic directions. Uh, and these two can be enhanced by the, the wealth of information that can now feed into these or potentially feed into these um, uh, going down the line. Um, there are many challenges in, uh, uh, in getting this information and, and allowing and, uh, and encouraging our citizens and us as citizens to contribute to this by sharing our information and our habits and things like that. Uh, the standards, uh, first of all, must be consistent across the industry if this is to work so that data sets can work together to reveal insight, uh, etc. Security is a big issue, of course, with data. Uh, and privacy is a very big data. There's no you know, there's no bad technologies, it's just bad use of technology by people. So w we are mindful and somewhat untrusting of uh, uh, people that want our data or want us to share our data. Uh, and we have to cha change that landscape because technology can be a very powerful force for good in our society. So we have to, you know, uh, uh, address the privacy issues and make sure that people are fully aware of the implications of, of feeding information back into society for the, the betterment of all and that, and be confident that it can be done uh, without any uh, downside from it. So uh, I want to show you what potentially is the, uh, uh, the future of what you'll be looking at and um, uh, what's, what's going to be, and is already happening in cities like Barcelona and across the world, uh, digital cities, sensors, 
feeding back information and allowing real-time adjustments, so not, not reactive, we're no longer reactive, we're proactive in, in dealing with this. We did have a problem with the last week, and that was a surprise to us. So we have to kind of facilitate that. I love working with cities and municipalities. They want to really understand how can technology and intelligent connectivity help them solve real world problems, like not having enough water, pollution, transportation, traffic, the ability to communicate and manage their overall network. And it all starts with just really understanding kind of the art of the possible, just changing the way that they think about their own departments. You're no longer the lighting department, you're the connectivity department because that light pole needs to do more than just light. What if it had a small cell on it? Solve density issues for a new up and coming area in a city. So now all of a sudden the lighting department's working with the transportation department. The concept of being able to combine a lot of those different franchises into a single unit is really, is something if I was to design a city, it would be intelligent enough to basically interact with its citizens and the government at the same time. So to me, an intelligent or smart city isn't so much about the type of technology or the type of connectivity that's being used, but it is about the fact that you've got data and information that's being shared across departments from department to department, as well as back to the citizens and then back again. So it's almost like a ever circling system. And eventually that makes the whole system even more efficient and effective and sustainable too. I think, you know, the, the unique thing about the work that we're doing in the IoT and industrial internet and smart cities, it's the fact that you have intelligent connectivity combining with human behavior. And that's really super transformative to really how we're going to live our lives. You are only limited by your imagination and what you know. So, um, I suppose that, uh, just to finish off there, I, I would argue, just as, the, just as we've heard arguments today about investing in the infrastructure of our society so that we can uh, put in place uh, the buildings and the housing and everything that we need, um, I think we need to really uh, look strategically at the information we're collecting that, that'll uh, our future decisions about Ireland and our place and space, uh, how they will be made. So uh, I would argue that as well as the infrastructure, uh, uh, physical infrastructure, we need to invest in the digital infrastructure to allow us to make better, faster, more reactive decisions for the benefit of all our citizens. Okay, thank you very much, Elizabeth. Oh, thanks, Pat, for that. Yeah, it's good to see Pat was uh, focusing a bit there on, um, which was mentioned this morning, housing shortage. Uh, Pat focused more there on uh, student housing, particularly with uh, an issue. So, strange thing happened, I suppose, to me last September. I was uh, walking the corridors of GMIT, and uh, after a week or two, many students pulling luggage behind them and Ryanair carry-on uh, type bags. Uh, so, that, that's not an odd thing in GMIT on a Friday evening when uh, a lot of students go back to their home place. However, this was happening every day uh, of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, which uh, struck me as strange. So curiosity got the better of me and I stopped some lads in the corridor and uh, asked them why they were dragging the luggage around the college. Uh, and what they told me was they were living in a, a hostel in Galway uh, and had to check out every morning as they couldn't get any proper student accommodation. Uh, so it really uh, made manifest the reality of the student housing crisis uh, around Galway that uh, particularly first years were suffering. So our next speaker is uh, Enda McGuane, uh, is Managing Director of Winters Property Management, uh, heavily involved in, in student housing. Uh, so Enda's focusing uh, on the issue of student housing specifically. Uh, Enda is a highly experienced uh, senior manager with 20 years experience across a broad range of industries, uh, both private and public sector. Prior to joining Winters, uh, Ender held the position of Deputy CAO and Financial Controller of Munster GAA, where he had responsibility for all their commercial aspects of their operations, as well as construction of a new regional headquarters and offices. Uh, Ender's also a professional member of FCSI, so uh, we'll ask uh, Ender to 
uh, inform us some more on the housing uh, crisis as it pertains to students. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I suppose the first thing I need to point out is that I think the last time I stood in this position was about 20 odd years ago. And this was actually the playing pitch in, in GMIT. And curiously enough, the gentleman who was controlling everything that was happening on the pitch was a guy called Sean O'Dee. I stand here today, 20 years later, and I look up at the back of the room, and the person I see up there is Sean O'Dee, who's controlling all the audiovisual and the equipment around the place. So if he starts to shout at me at any stage about go for a ball or anything like that, we're both having flashbacks. Um, Martin, first and foremost, I'd like to thank you very much. As always, this is a, an excellent event. Um, and you're great credit to yourself and to the college for organizing this a long time ago in a, in a different time and for taking it on to where it has become today. What I hope to do today is talk a little bit about and follow up on some of the themes that have been raised already. It's curious that Pat raised the issue of, uh, of infrastructure, or sorry, of information and how we utilize it, because that's a large part of what I intend to discuss this morning. I suppose it's clear that we have a huge uh, infrastructure shortfall. We also have huge shortfall of residential accommodation. And I suppose that's been manifest for a number of years, and obviously Rebuilding Ireland is making efforts to address that. Having said that, what we see as operators of accommodation, we see that we are tending to make some mistakes that we've made previously. And I suppose what we're trying to do here today, and what I'm hoping to do, is illustrate the use of data and analysis as to how we can make better, more sustainable buildings, and more ones that will last forward into the future. Uh, so I suppose, broad outline of the content. I'm also conscious of the time that we're running behind schedule, so I intend to pair this back to very much to, the, to focus on the meat of the issue. And essentially, that's about where we're building the accommodation and what we're building for students. And I'm all going to use a couple of case studies to illustrate probably some of the challenges that we're facing in terms of there is a narrative that if you build the stuff, they will come. So about Winters property, uh, we're one of the largest property service providers in the country. We're the largest student accommodation operator in Ireland. We're involved in the first development uh, of purpose-built student accommodation, which was done in the private sector just across the road from here in GMIT. Uh, we're an award-winning business, which has been involved in uh, I suppose mainly, at this point in time, operations of infrastructure. We don't own anything. We don't build it. We provide services to owners. Uh, and I suppose we're quite proud of the work we've done with the Irish Facility Management Awards. Uh, we have won the Residential Project of the Year for the last couple of years and are in for it again this year. And I suppose it's illustrative to, in to, to, to look at what we're winning it for. It's in the sense of this year, the two projects we're in for. One is a, uh, a property which was refurbished following water ingress, and the other is a commercial development which was refurbished following fire issues to go back to the building structures. And I suppose it goes back to Tom Parlin's point about B-carb. So moving on to today. Essentially, at the moment, there's an narrative out there, as I said, about student accommodation. And this is largely based on a number of documents. So you're looking at the Department of Education and Sciences projections for student accommodation, which I'll go through in a minute. You're looking at the HEA report on purpose-built student accommodation, which was built in, or was produced in 2014, and obviously Rebuilding Ireland. Actually, what a lot of people don't realize is that one of the commitments from Rebuilding Ireland is an interdepartmental work group on the supply of student accommodation. It asks you to deliver later on this year, and we're hoping to be involved in part of that process. And I suppose a simple picture here is, this is where it's going. It's what everybody in construction likes to see, demand going upwards, student numbers going from 165 right the way up over 210. I suppose we are at this point in the process now, and the numbers are just about to tip 190,000. This is the forecast in terms of student accommodation. I suppose a couple of points to note on that uh, is that this is the other side of that. So this is the stock as it was in 2014. Uh, and you can see here that Dublin, Limerick have the majority of public stock. And when I talk about public stock, I'm talking about stock that's in the ownership of a third level institute, university or an, or an IOT. The curious thing about the public stock um, is that if you take UCD and Trinity and you well out of that equation, public stock is probably slightly under 5,000 beds. Now, since that point in time, UCD have embarked on our plans for another 3,000 bed spaces. And obviously in Dublin, in the private sector, we see approximately 10,000 bed spaces either in planning or in construction. And I'm going to address some of those in a minute. I suppose the other factor that's worth noting in this, which is much maligned Section 50, this is all this private stock was predominantly Section 50 property, which was built over the last 15 or 20 years. I suppose the one advantage of that is that we wouldn't have the stock today if it wasn't in involved, uh, Section 50 hadn't been there. Having said that, what it does mean is that we have a lot of stock in locations 
which are not necessarily matching the previous graph, which is the growth in student numbers. Uh, so look, that's from a historical perspective. When you go into an international comparison, the narrative is very clear. People always say that, well, look, in the Irish cities, we have approximately 10% of our student population is, can be housed in purpose-built student accommodation, whereas Manchester, Liverpool, Edinburgh, it's 20, 25%. Manchester in particular, you know, over 80,000 students in, in, that, in that city. Uh, having, and that the, the narrative is that purpose-built student accommodation, bed spaces, that there was a shortfall of 31,000. Uh, sorry, that there was 31,000 for 168,000 students in 2014. That meant an unmet demand of about 25,000 from the HEA report. And that demand for student bed space is projected to be almost uh, 68,000 which would give you a total of 34%. So why are we forecasting a total of, you know, why should we provide purpose-built student accommodation for 34% of the population? What's the driver from that, from Manchester's at 20, 25%? The driver is the other target, which is a target that the third level institutions have been to deliver a large percentage of their student populations for non-EU students. The main driver in that instance is obviously, it's, it's, it's not debated by fees, but it's most debated by ratings. So that's the, the standard narrative that's out there, which is influencing the development of a lot of the student accommodation across the country. But let's look at a case study. So, Pat, I would suspect by looking at the bubble, some of these are, are, are figures which have come from yourselves. This is something which was in the Irish Times recently. And this is Grange Gorman, for those who are not familiar. There's a new campus. Uh, there's the, the, the river. Uh, the new Lewis will run roughly, if I get it right, up around here. The new red line is due to go up there. I should know exact in detail. Parts of this part of the city are also part of the Living City Initiative, the tax bill. I know that because we did an operations plan on the site in here, which was just 50 metres shy of it, unfortunately. But when you look at that, to put all the bubbles together in simple terms, there's 8,000 bed spaces planned in that site, uh, in around that site. And the narrative is that the, uh, there's 20,000 students going to be on that campus. Great, does it not make perfect sense? 8,000 beds, 20,000 students. So let's, to use Pat's analogy, let's look at the figures in a small bit more detail. The actual figure is 20,860 is what GIT claim will be on the campus when it's full. However, of that, 14,800 will be full-time students. The other 6,000 are postgraduate students who largely don't rely on student accommodation. They're either in the workplace, working part-time, or they're in private residential accommodation. So that leaves you with a, a target mark for 14,000. Minus the 8,880 that live at home, because that's what happens in Dublin. 60% of the student population live at home. In Galway, it's closer to 50%, and some of the other cities down to 45. So now the target market is 6,000 of that population. Remember, we started with 8,000 beds. 6,000. Again, the normal ratio of student, uh, purpose-built student accommodation to private rent rental market is 2 to 1, which means 4,000 to 2,000. So now the, the target market of purpose-built student accommodation is 2,000. And curiously enough, that's exactly the amount or slightly under the amount that's going to be built on the campus. The campus will build 2,500. I suppose the point I'm illustrating here is all these figures are actually contained in Grange Gorman's tender document, which was issued in 2014, the analysis and the actual reports to verify where we're coming from. The point I'm making about this is the ratios at the no moment, the normal ratios, don't apply. Traditionally, undergraduate students, postgraduate students, particularly second, third, fourth years, would have gone into the private residential market. Undergraduate or postgrad students the same. Purpose-built student accommodation in Ireland traditionally tended to be for first years, as it was a safe, secure environment away from home. And that has changed a lot over the last five years. And, you know, to give you an example, we sold out 1,500 bed spaces in an hour and a half three weeks ago for next year. That was an hour and a half online. Now, those are being sold, again, as I said, to second, third, and fourth years, because the reality is next year's first years have just about completed their CEA. They haven't done a leaving cert, and they don't know where they're going. And they come into the market in August. So the narrative that has built up about student accommodation is reflective of where we are in the broader perspective of that a shortfall in overall residential accommodation. So in, in, in terms of us, sir, I'll just go back slightly. When people approach us to do development appraisals, and I'll go back one more again on sites, we've recently told somebody who approached us about a site uh, close enough to the college, north uh, up there, in that vicinity up there, not to even think about going for student accommodation. It's a commercial development. They were going to do some, uh, res some uh, retail on the ground floor and res student on the, on the upper floors. He said they're better off to go with resident, normal private residential accommodation because of this sort of mix. 
Now, obviously, you have Trinity over here. You have a whole host of other sites, and some of this accommodation will fall into use. But within a number of years, four or five years, when the residential market picks up, what we see happening is the closeness to the college becomes more important. So all the peripheral sites will start to struggle to fill. What we will also see is that it's difficult to fill these smaller sites. Not to, to fill them, but to actually make them financially viable. We would estimate a number of 120 bed spaces is about the right basic number to put together for purpose-built student accommodation as it's currently considered. So that's just a broader picture in terms of where we are. The other thing we focus on with people is we ask the question. The amount of times I've gone into sites and I've been asked, well, we're looking to build X amount of students. Why? Because there's a shortfall. And then I ask the question, what type of students? Who are you building for? And again, it goes back to Pat's point about analysis and market. Every student has a different requirement. So an Irish first year and a foreign, a, U, a US first year are two different, completely different students who require two di completely different things. US students will use twin bedrooms and quite amenable to do it from their dorms in the States. The Irish students tend to prefer single rooms. First years are different to undergrads, postgrads. First years, obviously, as, as the Fergal Barry mentioned early on, have different challenges in terms of dropout rates, of finding their way in the world. There's a whole host of issues in terms of management and operations and so on. You also have differences between university and IOT sites in terms of demographics of students. I suppose the other thing that's obviously important is the foreign student market. This is the kind of thing that in the UK has been put forward as the holy grail, as foreign, Middle Eastern, Chinese students who are affluent and wealthy get to come to their countries to learn languages and get their postgraduate qualifications. The one thing we find is that you need to decide when you're building, who are you building for? So is it married? Those, a lot of those foreign students, particularly some of the Saudi students, tend to have families coming in. And that creates other issues in terms of management and operational sites, in terms of how you configure development. So when you think of that the all these variables, and the majority of the sites built currently are cluster bedrooms, five and six beds. And same as we built for year after year after year, with no consideration for the challenges that are there. And also when you consider the previous slides about potential oversupply of this, and what are we going to do with this accommodation going forward in five years' time, when the cycle comes around, as every cycle does. I suppose just to give you, again, the foreign student market, just to illustrate that a little bit, these figures are a month old, they're from the Department of Justice. Anyone that is going to spend more than 90 days in the country is required to register because of the challenges that were fo faced by, I suppose, the, uh, the kind of English language training market that was there for a number of years. But curiously, when you look at these, if you take the Brazilians and the Chinese out of it, and particularly take the majority of those guys are, learning English, are here to learn English, they're not formal third level colleges. We've had them in some of our sites in Athlone, we've had Brazilians, Obviously, a lot of Chinese went to Athlone. Shannon College would have a lot of Chinese students, but the majority of these, almost 10,000, I would say, of that total, you could almost discount as being third level. They're here to learn English language skills. When you look at the likes of the USA students, we would view that that's a double count. Because at the moment, we have semester two students from NUIG who are in for their semester this year. There are, sorry, now in, in Galway. They'll go home in May. New students will come in in September, October to replace them. They're not taking up any extra bed spaces, the same beds, but it's just a different rotation. I suppose, again, it's the point that Pat made, the devil of all these things is in the detail. And the one issue about what is the, is, uh, the challenge facing the universities is the ranking structure. Because these students are making decisions about where they go. And obviously, Brexit presents us with a magnificent opportunity in this sense, if the visa issues that are emerged there emerge. But the challenge is students have money, they make decisions about where is the university or the college, what way is it ranked globally, will I go there? What sort of qualification will I get? And I'm going to move it along slightly. Again, this is a slide that CBRE produced, both of them, which are about millennials, which is the Irish student market, which is most of the guys that we see behind in, in the hall here today. People born between 1982 and 2000 and what they require. And their requirements for living space are dramatically different than other people, than our, my generations would have been. The curious statistic here is they spend 50% of the income is spent on disposable. Uh, by disposable, it's, it, it's food, it's recreating. Uh, they spend 10 days a week out socialising. So the way they live, and they, there's a whole host of slides in that CBRE report, it's very informative, which are summarized here. The live, work, play buzz, which you'll have all heard about de development. We're dealing with MetLife inside in town, who, uh, sorry, we're dealing with MetLife, we're also dealing with another company inside in town who are recruiting millennials at the moment. When you talk to these guys who've come from the continent, what they want is a 15 minute commute, max, which is reflective up here. They want to live close as possible to work. They socialize in the town, that's what's bringing them into the town, the play aspect of it. And to be honest, their workspace is very much like, um, Gavin, uh, um, originally designed, uh, sorry, the first presentation we got early on, 
these fantastic areas where they spend an awful lot of their time. And they're designed there so that, you know, Google, Oracle, is to make it a pleasant, convivial working environment. They go out, they recreate, they live, they work, and I suppose essentially what they do is go home to sleep in many instances. Um, so I suppose the demands are different. And again, these are the people that the target market is for. It's the millennial population. There's one thing that the UK has that they're starting to do with what's called cooperative living. It's something that's developed in both London, uh, New York, and to a degree in Paris. And essentially what it is, is it's a heightened student accommodation experience where all the services are provided on site. Uh, I know that there was one proposed in terms of Dublin at one stage where it was going to have uh, hire cars in the department in the basement. It's for people to come in, to live in a space like this. You can see the living space isn't exactly huge, but it is well apportioned and well appointed. <coughs> the emphasis is on the communal spaces and the collective spaces that were highlighted early on. So that's one thing, and that's a, a, a place called, uh, let me see this, bear with me, it's Old Oak, it's 50, 550 service rooms in London. Now you might say, okay, that's London, what has all that got to do with us? The issues we face here are, as I said, from a design perspective, we're still reliant on section 50. Uh, all those departments, I, or those bed spaces I talked about in Dublin, those 8,000, you might say, well look, we bring them into the residential market if students don't take them. The problem is, they're all built under that. So if you want to use them for something other than student accommodation, you have to go into change of planning. Uh, and as a lot of them are designed as cluster apartments, five and six bedrooms, which are very, very difficult to rent in the residential market. So I suppose, as I say, these are some of the legacy design issues, and I'm conscious a little bit of where we are in terms of time. What we see happening going forward is looking at alternative means of delivery of this type of accommodation, and delivering accommodation which is a bit more flexible. So there are two constraints on that. One is the location because the desired uh, place for student accommodation is close to the college. It also tends to be in the middle of city centres, that's where our, most of our colleges are now, which means it's expensive. And the second aspect is what you use the space for. So I'm going to put up four different designs, which I've encountered from across, of U across Europe, effectively. Uh, some of them are quite interesting. The first one is a place called Scape in London. So this is inner city infill site. What you're looking at here, 600 student beds. Curiously, 12.5 square meters in terms of space. Uh, rooms feature a lot of safe space-saving devices, and again, they're built as pods off-site, so relatively easy for construction. This is the finish in some of your, your rooms. Again, it's your 12 meter square, so you can see your, your window also acts as your sofa, for want of a better word. You have a wet room. There's a wet room in there. You have a kitchenette, uh, basic facility there, and your workspace desk. This is the actual common areas. As you can see, it's well finished. The feel is more like a hotel. This is the key factor to this, is these communal spaces downstairs. Your coffee docks, your space downstairs for people to recreate, to collaborate. And it goes back to the point of the original first presentation. People want to spend time in these spaces. They may engage with the people around them, but they may be on their phones or on their devices. But it's to create an atmosphere for people to mix. And that's what the focus on these, uh, uh, the of these sites is. The next one is one in Berlin. And this one is a different twist in it. Well, this is a converted industrial building. Okay, So this one is slightly different. So you can see in the sense that one is 260 rooms spread across two buildings. The challenge here was how to utilize the space and to convert it efficiently. As you can see, the one thing that you note here, they're both twin rooms. You'll also note that these are mobile. So the configuration of the rooms can change on a regular basis. The one thing about this, and it's a point I mentioned earlier, this is focusing on international students, hence why the twin rooms are, I suppose, acceptable if you want to call it that. You also have a wet room, which is designed in here. The emphasis in this building was about utilizing the space that existed, this is an external view, but to best efficiency to create bed spaces without spending a huge amount of money refurbing them. We've looked at a number of hotel proposals over the years, and essentially in most of them we would have left the hotel largely as it was because of the cost of refurb. Uh, Again, the common areas here, very, very well finished, designed to have people recreating and spending time. This one is one that could be used in Galway City. It's a bit out there, but it's one from Copenhagen. So what it is is shipping containers, stacked up as like this and, and in the bay. Now it looks quite nice in that in the, in the, in the, uh, at night time and lit up, well lit up. This is the actual configuration as it is currently tested, and these are the rooms. Again, the bed space, uh, space is about 12 square meters in terms of that. And you might say this is a bit outlandish, the idea of using something like this. The reality is we're only half a mile away from, from 15 of these, if I remember correctly. Transfer Care West have used some modular buildings like these to extend on their premises. Now, they're not perfect. We've used them 
and I've looked at them from designs. The issues here is specifically the height you can go to, the densities. If you look at a site, you have to have a serviced site, like a normal service on the ground. You can only go so high in modernized buildings. But again, it's showing what they have done facing a challenge, and it's a city centre challenge. And again, the reason why they're using the water, because they want to have cheap, affordable accommodation in the city centre for their students. The last place is a place called Meadow in Spitalfields in London. Now this is the creme de la creme, in the sense that this is targeting those students, the foreign students, who are very, very affluent. This has been described as almost like a gentleman's club, in the sense it has a concierge, it has all those sort of facilities. It's over 32, 33 storeys, uh, and the finish is, is opulent enough. Again, it's a converted building, but again, they've made it, they created a space that they just roofed over. It was an open space to utilize for meetings. And, and one of the aspects you notice with all these sort of cooperative living spaces is the idea that you have a space that can be utilized for meetings, to encourage people to mix and to run courses or to, to, to just get people to integrate. So I suppose, look, I'm conscious of where we are in terms of time. What am I saying about it? You have to design these things for operation to make the best use of space, to make sure that you have the basic little things like broadband, access control, security, durability of foot, foot fit out of school. And this is another aspect to this that seems to be a little bit lost in the mix. Uh, access control and security on site are very, very important because traditionally purpose-built student accommodation was for first years and parents are, you're selling it or who the target market are. They make the decisions to buy. From a social perspective and control of site, you are in running student accommodation, and I'm conscious the audience is full of students here, you have young people who are making their way in the world. And people tend to, like all of us, make mistakes. So to give you an example of the challenges you face in operating in this environment, uh, in the last six weeks, um, we had a drug overdose, diabetic coma, uh, we had the emergency response unit on a site for an attempted suicide, and we had a drugs bust all in this city. And that's nothing to do with the individual, well it is to do with the individuals obviously, but it's nothing to do with students per se. Students are students, they're, they're part of the population. But I suppose how you design and operate the site and the ability to manage <coughs> those sort of issues is key to how successful the site will be. So to finish, our key recommendations are always when someone comes to us. The first thing, location. Proximity to college and city will always be key. In the longer term it will always secure the, the valuability, uh, the, the nature of the asset. It's important to identify the demographic. Who are you building for and what are you building? Uh, and I suppose always there's a trade-off between design then between the demographic of the site. So if you look at infill sites, if you use a smaller single room sort of design, which has those 12 meter beds, 12 meter square bed spaces, you can get more beds in, but you can also get maximum use of the site because people would pay to be proximate, to be close to the college, to be in the city centre. You also then have a greater use for those sites in the going forward into the future. Uh, so I suppose, look, forgive me if I've rushed a little bit through that, but I'm conscious of where we are at time. And thank you very much for your time. Uh, thanks, Ender. Um, we might have, a, is there any questions from the floor for our speakers? No? Oh. The lunch is beckoning. Um, so just uh, to a point for, for outside guests of the college today, you're welcome to join us for lunch in the main GMIT canteen. Mark Deegan here. Uh, Mark, stand up please. Uh, Mark will be able to give you a lunch voucher if you want to join us. Um, the conference reconvenes in this room at 1.50.